Please listen carefully. Hi, to all you boys and girls out there in podcast land, we have a very special episode for you today. It's what I hope will be a more regular occurrence here on the show. I've always described this show as This American Life for Filmmakers. Well, if you listen to that show, you know that host Ira Glass always introduces the show as a story that sets the stage for that episode's theme, then has anywhere from three to five produced radio stories about that theme. During those stories, This American Life producers take the place of Ira, being the voice of their respective stories. Usually it's some kind of combination of interviews and scripted segments. Sometimes they have a guest producer or like an author who reads an excerpt from a book or short story. I've always wanted to do something similar with Radio Film School. I've dabbled in it here and there. Last year I had the History of Cinema collaboration with the Circuit Podcast. That's actually one of my favorites from the first season. We've also had guest spot produced segments for our Breaking the Glass miniseries with co-producer and friend of the show Yolanda Cochran. And today we have another guest produced spot I know you're going to love. Lastly, before we get started, I want to give huge props and thanks to Lens Pro to Go. Now, way back in 2010, when I started my last podcast, Crossing the 180, Lens Pro to Go was a sponsor and supported that show throughout its entire run. And I'm thrilled to have them back on Radio Film School for the next few months. If you've listened to me for any considerable amount of time or heard me speak on any other podcast, at some point you've heard my soapbox about the dangers of getting into debt to get equipment. Well, nowadays, there's absolutely no excuse. Lens Pro to Go makes it easy for you to find the filmmaking or photography equipment you need for any project. And here's the best part. The people who work there are themselves experienced filmmakers and photographers. So they can answer any questions you have about the gear, as well as give you tips and suggestions. It's straight up grade A customer service. And their prices include two-day shipping for all of their items. So there's no shipping surprise cost at the end when you get to the checkout page. Everything is shipped to you in Pelican cases with return address labels already printed and ready to go. So all you have to do is put the gear back in the box that it came in, tape it up, slap on the label, and then take it to your nearest UPS store or schedule a pickup. Sorry for your international folks, they are only available in the U.S. And of course, they have a special offer for our listeners. Use the offer code RADIO when you check out and get 10% off your order. So go to lensprotogo.com today to gear up for your next project. All right, without further ado, on with the show. I lost everything. That dog was a final gift from my dying wife. Jonathan. You got out once. You dip so much as a pinky back into this pond, you may find something reaching out to pull you back in. It's personal. That's a scene from the 2014 movie John Wick, starring Keanu Reeves as a badass assassin who once tried to give up the killer's life, but is dragged back into the business when he goes to avenge the killing of his dog. Yeah, his dog. The sequel was recently released here in the States, and for many people, is one of the most widely anticipated films of the year. This was an unassuming little movie that took everyone by surprise. The action was amazing, the story was strong, and the characters were compelling. One of the most interesting characters, quote-unquote, wasn't a person at all. It was a hotel, the Continental. Now, from what we gather in the film, the hotel is a sort of safe haven for an international ring of assassins. Assassins who stay here apparently all know one another. They most likely have even attempted to kill one another. But when they're at the Continental, there's a sacred set of rules that strictly forbids quote-unquote business to be undertaken while within its hallowed walls. Break those rules, and the penalty is death. Now, what's so intriguing about the Continental is not what we see that takes place there, but it's what we don't see. The subtle and nuanced glances, the greeting that the concierge gives John when he approaches the desk. He knows John. He knows John is a killer yet he treats him like a royal ambassador. There is a, a subtext, a, a mystery, 
So much is said about both John and the hotel by these little comments and glances. It's by far one of the best parts of the movie. So much so that many fans of the movie have said they'd love to see a spin-off sequel or even a Netflix series based on the history of the Continental. These mysterious allusions to the history of the hotel and its patrons are an excellent example of iceberg storytelling. What is iceberg storytelling? Well, that's the subject of today's episode. It's a methodology that can take your storytelling to a whole new level. I'm Ron Dawson, and this is Radio Film School, A Filmmaker's Journey. Three weeks after Radio Film School launched in September of 2015, the popular filmmaking website No Film School did a great little write-up about it called The Filmmaker's Podcast We've All Been Waiting For. The author of that piece was filmmaker and writer Robert Hardy. Robert has since branched off to start his own website and resource to inspire filmmakers, filmmakersprocess.com. Robert wanted to do something different than what he was doing at No Film School. I think he and I are two filmmakers cut from the same cloth. When you read his motivation for starting Filmmaker's Process, it sounds very much like why I started Radio Film School. Here's what he writes on his about page for the site. Things you'll never read about here. The latest cameras, lenses, support gear, etc. Massive Hollywood directors and movies. How to sell your screenplay or to get into Sundance. Instead, you'll find in-depth articles about making films that you're generally proud to share with the world. Honing your craft and finding your unique artistic voice defining filmmaking success for yourself, and then actually achieving it. Those words are music to my ears. Not that that other stuff isn't important, but as I've often shared on the show, getting in touch with who you are as an artist and a human being will far and away have the most profound impact on your work, and more importantly, set you apart from everyone else. So when Robert started this site, and I read the kind of articles he was writing, I knew I wanted to reach out to him to be a guest producer on this show. He knew right away which of his articles he wanted to adapt for this podcast. I'll let Robert take it from here. For sale. Baby shoes. Never worn. This is Ernest Hemingway's infamous six-word short story, supposedly written after a barroom bet with a group of his contemporaries. It's also one of the finest examples ever conceived of what I like to call iceberg storytelling. Let me explain. Imagine with me an iceberg, sturdy, solemn, floating aimlessly through the South Atlantic. From above, it appears to be a certain size, large and foreboding, sure, but self-contained. In our storytelling metaphor, this is your story. It's what the audience sees and hears. It's what you explicitly tell them. But when our gaze travels beneath the surface of the cold, icy water, we see that only a small portion of its total mass was visible to the naked eye. The remainder of that mass, the majority of it even, lays beneath the surface. In our metaphor, if the tip of the iceberg is what the audience sees and hears, this enormous dark mass beneath the surface is your subtext. It's what your audience feels. And that's where the immense power of iceberg storytelling comes from. So let's get back to Hemingway's story, For Sale, Baby Shoes, Never Worn, and let's dissect what's really happening here. In the case of this particular story, the tip of the iceberg is what Hemingway gives us. It's those six sparse, haunting words. Yet the story is far more than just those words. Beneath the tip of that iceberg lays the subtext, which forces us to imagine the circumstances under which this advertisement was written. It forces us to imagine a miscarriage, a stillbirth, a failed delivery. It forces us to imagine the pain of a grieving mother selling the shoes because they're a constant reminder of the child that never was. It's powerful stuff. And it's all completely imagined. Just a heartbreaking story based on hints left by six words. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. So now for the real question. What does iceberg storytelling look like in the context of filmmaking? And how can we, as filmmakers, take advantage of its tremendous power? 
In order to answer this, I reached out to Kasim Norris, a talented cinematographer, colorist, and director based out of Indianapolis. He put out a short film last year called It Eats You Up, and it's really the epitome of an iceberg story. Shot in glorious, grainy Super 16 by Norris himself, the bulk of It Eats You Up takes place in a dingy prison visiting room. Let me paint you a word picture to set the scene that's about to unfold. A young woman, maybe 23, sits across from an older man, late 30s perhaps. He's wearing a prison uniform, and he has a dark beanie on his head. She slides him a carton of cigarettes. He looks down at the table, thinking, clearly struggling with something, before sliding them back. And that's where we join the two. Why are you still coming here? What do you mean? You know, when you first told me I was your father, I didn't think it was possible. And I remember how wild I was. And no matter how much I wanted it, it just didn't add up. You say you found me in the newspaper. Okay. So that man I killed 13 years ago. What was his name? Why can't you say his name, Tara? Look, you ain't gotta say it. I understand why you've been coming here, feeding me this shit about being your father. The minute I wanted you to be my daughter was when I knew you wasn't. That man I killed was your father. As we did with the Hemingway piece, let's break down what's actually happening here. From this single scene, which is essentially a well-crafted monologue, we can gather so much information about the larger story at play in this film. First and foremost, we can piece together a narrative about Tara, the young woman, seeking out her father's killer, finding him in prison, and then convincing him that she's his daughter. All of this in a wayward attempt to gain emotional closure of some sort. And though we don't actually see any of this, it's pretty easy to imagine, thanks to smart dialogue, which continuously drops just small, subtle hints. Beyond the basic story, though, which is pretty compelling in and of itself, we're able to tap into the pain of these two people. So we have a young woman who had her father taken away at a young age, and it's left a hole in her, and she, she wants closure, maybe even revenge. And then we have a prisoner who regrets every single day the thing that put him behind bars. And this pain is made even worse by the fact that his victim's daughter is sitting right across from him. These are emotionally complex characters in an emotionally complex situation, and despite the fact that we spend less than four minutes with them, and they tell us very little of their situation through the dialogue, we as the audience can feel the full weight of that complexity, and it's, it's borderline overbearing. So why would a filmmaker choose to travel this road and tell these more stripped down, barebone stories? There are, of course, plenty of aesthetic advantages. There's an argument to be made that audiences will feel more deeply, think more critically, connect more broadly if they're filling in those story gaps with their own imaginations and drawing from their own experiences and emotional backgrounds. But this is also a practical technique for low-budget filmmakers everywhere. Think of iceberg storytelling as a way to supercharge the impact of your story while stripping away some of the production hurdles that make producing indie films so difficult. If you could tell an effective story with fewer shots, fewer characters, fewer locations, and fewer lines of dialogue, why wouldn't you? The audience comes away with a better, more impactful experience, and you, as the filmmaker, spend less time and money in production and post because you stripped away everything that wasn't essential. So I recently had the opportunity to speak with Kasim over the phone 
to get his thoughts about the making of the film and to hear how he applied iceberg storytelling to It Eats You Up. Let's take a listen. You summed it up so beautifully, and I couldn't have done it any better than what you did. And I think that's the reason why you're in the position you're in, because you're you're an amazing writer and you have a way um, with words. But um, with what I wanted to do, you kind of coined the 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 iceberg thing, you know, uh, but in a nutshell, what I wanted to do was um, showcase the most honest betrayal of the human experience. And to me, the human experience, you know, I'm fascinated with the idea of just dropping someone in um, in a world, in a story without any explanation. And, you yeah. know, um, you pretty much summed it up well. And that's exactly what I was trying to do with it eats you up was to just kind of drop you in without any explanation and just give you just a small tip of this person's um story just to drop you in right at the climax and then leave it up to your own imagination and your own interpretation to decide and not only just to decide but to connect the dots and also to to connect um because i just think with with films um i think a lot of times we give too much and i think Mm -hmm. um it, it, by giving too much it, it really it really strips away um it strips away this thing where it doesn't allow people to connect as much as it can and i think that if we give um just enough we don't have to give it all i think if we give just enough people will be able to see themselves in a story they'll be able to connect their own past if i just give you the present you know, and, and, and I don't even give you an explanation or I don't give you a reason for the future or the past. You'll start connecting your own past to this present. And that's kind of what I wanted to do, you know, just allow someone just to peek in a window. So I just became really fascinated with this idea of just um, just taking someone on this really short journey and just giving them just a glimpse into someone else's life. And I feel like that is the ultimate human experiences, because when we cross paths with each other, we'll, you know, we only give each other uh, the the top layers, you know, the iceberg. We only we only give each other the top. We don't really share with each other everything that lies beneath, you know. Yeah. And so we kind of, you know, even we can have this relationship like Robert. I can have this relationship with you for like uh, we can have like a five year relationship. And I may only know just the surface of your life and not really know everything that you know, that, that really falls underneath that. And everything that's underneath that is what made this, this top, you know, what it is. It's really what's allowing the top to be at surface, to, to, to stay afloat. But I'm only giving you so much, you know, yeah. because I don't really even know how to tackle what's beneath. And so for me with the Eats You Up, I attacked it, I went into it with the idea that I wanted to give people the ultimate human experience. And I think that's the reason why, to be honest with you, there was a lot of people who was upset who were like emailing me about it, like, yo, I really liked it. It looked really good. You know, I just, I don't understand, you know, why it was dropped off the way that it was, why we didn't have any explanation. And I was just like, my response was just like, that's life. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the, that's the, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, you know, when you meet someone, that's kind of what happens. You know, you really don't get everything. You only get so much. And it's, it's up to us to, based upon how we interact with one another, to, you know, to go back. And sometimes when we meet each other, we may go back home and we may think about the conversations that we had. And then we start to add things up based upon um, someone's posture or how they were sitting or you know sometimes when you talk to a person you really don't get it all within that one conversation sometimes you have to go back and analyze the conversation of like wait a minute did he disrespect me i thought <laughs> I, you know what i thought about that when we were talking i didn't even think about it at the time i wish i had because i would have i would have went off but now i'm able to look at it and his posture was just all wrong he was like all closed off then we start building this bigger this bigger picture, this bigger thing that's beneath this surface conversation. And so that's kind of how I want to attack it. And I feel like you really put it, you, I mean, you said it best, man. Like, uh, I, I never really knew about the iceberg theory, um, but it really is exactly what I was trying to accomplish. You really summed it up, man.
And another thing too, and I'll add this and I'll, I'll, I'll promise this is it for this topic. <laughs> but what I noticed is the reason why I said stop watching films was not because like the typical film is whack, but I really noticed myself as an artist, and I think all artists have the same thing, that our inspiration, that is our Burger King, that is our McDonald's, that is our that that is our source of energy, you know, right? That that that's the fast food. When we see the newest, latest film coming out, we're like, yo, I have to go see that, you know, because we're geared. We want to get that inspiration or that source of energy to to to, to keep creating or to get this um, to get these new ideas or to get this image of breaking these new boundaries and and what we can do next and you know and things like that. But the the flip side to that is stripping away. Um, stripping away those things because sometimes those things can become uh, a bit of a crutch. And it also, I don't know about other artists, but for me, I wanted to to walk into my project, my feature, the proof of concept is short, it eats you up and riot. Um, I wanted to walk into it um, as sincere as I possibly could and, and, and as honest with myself as I possibly could. And yeah. Uh, just quite frankly, I just I believe that sometimes watching other films a lot it's a little bit too much. I didn't want the uh, the influence, you know, and, and and that's really what it's all about. I think sometimes if you if you spend too much of your time watching another artist, sometimes we don't even recognize how the influence just crosses over. It just spills over a little bit too much, you know. Yeah. Nothing's I I do realize and I acknowledge that nothing's nothing is ever original you know but i i, I want to be as original as i possibly can you know i want as much as my own influence as i possibly can so when i said watch people a lot of times if you're watching people then you're going to be watching the people that 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 surround your own personal life so that's your own personal experience so when i said watch people you i meant you're literally watching your own life you're literally watching the people around you and less of the people who you can't connect with, with other people's inspiration, with other films and things like that. So when I said that, in short, I mean, um, try to cut off as much of other influence as you possibly can and be more influenced by your own reflection and your own story and your own experiences. And that's what I think what allowed me to dive as deep as I did and with it eat you up because I was just telling my own story. If people didn't like it, then, hey, you don't like my life then. You know, and, and that's how I win it. So if you do, then it's, hey, at least I know if I'm being honest with myself, then, hey, if these people really like this, then they must really like what I have to offer, you know, yeah. because this is this is the way I really feel. And so that's why that was another reason why I said that to stop watching films and watch people. So there you have it. An in-depth look at iceberg storytelling and a few of the ways that you can apply this technique to your own work. But as we wrap up, there's one more thought I want to leave you with. I think what we've discussed here is far more than just another storytelling strategy to keep in your back pocket. As the world of indie film becomes more and more saturated as more of us make films, it's going to become much much harder to stand out from the crowd. So those of us who want to push further and make our own success in this world, we're going to have to craft our content so that it connects with audiences on a much deeper level. It won't be enough to just tell the same stories as everyone else and tell them in the same ways. We'll have to figure out how to go deeper and create those genuine connections with the people watching. In the end, I think iceberg storytelling is going to be a phenomenal tool to accomplish that. Whether we apply it to short films, features, web series, or anything else, iceberg stories will allow audiences to participate in our content. They'll bring themselves to it, their histories, their understandings of the world. As filmmakers and storytellers, that is an incredible opportunity. And for those of us who care deeply about making impactful work that stays with audiences well beyond the last frame, it's an opportunity we can't afford to miss. So go forth, tell compelling stories, and don't be afraid to look beneath the surface of the water, because that's where the magic happens.
Thanks, Robert, for that amazing segment for the show. If you want to read the original article that this episode was based on, or if you want to read some other amazing articles about what it means to be a filmmaker, please go to filmmakersprocess.com. If you've ever wanted to dip your toes into podcasting and have an idea you think would be a great spot for the show, hit me up with an email at radiofilmschool at daredreamer.fm. Radio Film School is a production of Dare Jumera Media and is a proud member of the Podcastica Network, a small collection of pop culture podcasts that cover topics from your favorite television shows to meditation and health to podcast production. This and other great shows can be found at podcastica.com. Music for this episode was curated from freemusicarchive.org and artlist.io. Links to tracks are in the show notes. If you like what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes, and while you're there, leave us a rating and a review. You can also find the show on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and our RSS feed is on every blog post for each episode. Another way you can support the show is consider becoming a Dare Dreamer Premium member. Premium membership helps keep the show going and putting out great weekly content. And for about the price of used baby shoes on Craigslist, just a few bucks a month, you not only support the show, but you get access to ebooks, templates, bonus episodes, discounts on other products and services, and other resources to help you grow in your craft and your career. So go to daredreamer.fm slash join to learn more. Now, if you're not ready to become a member, another way you can support the show is to use Lens Pro to go next time you need to rent equipment in the United States. If you want top-notch customer service from working filmmakers and photographers, look no further than lensprotogo.com. Everything shipped to you in Pelican cases. Two-day shipping is included in all the prices. And if you use the offer code RADIO, you'll save yourself 10%. That's lensprotogo.com. Giving them your business is a wonderful way to support Radio Film School. You can follow me on Twitter at Terry Moran, where I curate links and stories about filmmaking, photography, social media, technology, and marketing and branding. I also love engaging with listeners there. So say hi. Engage in the conversation. If you just want to stay notified with what's up on the show, follow us at Radio Film School. If you like this episode, share it on Twitter, Facebook, and email it to a friend. That's it for this week, folks. Remember, if the story sucks, I don't care what you shot it with or cut it off. You're listening to Dare Dreamer FM, the sound of creative expression. Hmm? Ah! Oh. Oh,